Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Now one thing that strikes me as very odd about all of this is the Quran's repeated claims to hidden knowledge. It's referred to as the unseen, which required revelation to be made known. That is one of the stories of the unseen. We inspired you with it. You were not with them when they cast their pens to see which one of them would take charge of Mary, nor were you with them when they were disputing. However, as numerous scholars have shown, the Protogospel of James was very well known and very widely used. It was even translated into Syriac around the fifth century. The point here is that it's utter nonsense for the Quran to claim that this very well-known story is part of the unseen, requiring special revelation to know. Rather, they have denied that which they encompass not in knowledge and whose interpretation has not yet come to them. We were with the Prophet when he raised his sight to the sky. Then he said, This is the time when knowledge is to be taken from the people, until what remains of it shall not amount to anything. So Ziad bin Labid al-Ansari said, How will it be taken from us while we recite the Quran? By Allah we recite it and our women and children recite it. The Torah and the Gospel are with the Jews and the Christians, but what do they avail of them? Think about what happens here. Muhammad tells his followers that knowledge is going to be taken away from the Muslim community. His companion Ziyad is confused by this. He wants to know how it's possible for knowledge to depart from the Muslim community when they have the Quran and they recite the Quran. Muhammad points to the Jews and Christians and says, they still have the Torah and the Gospel, don't they? Notice that Muhammad's response makes no sense if he thought that the Torah and the Gospel had been corrupted. He only brings up the Torah and the Gospel to show that just because you have reliable scriptures and you teach them and you quote them, this doesn't mean you're on the right track. So Muhammad was clearly convinced that the Torah and the Gospel being read and recited by Jews and Christians in the 7th century were the inspired, preserved, authoritative words of Allah. Many times, many children, they think that the books of Torah and Injil are the books of misguidance. They were sent to the Jews and the Christians and they are bad books. This is not true. Torah was given to Prophet Musa, Musa as you know, and Injil was given to Prophet Isa. These two books are from Allah. They are like Quran, which was given to Prophet Muhammad. So as good Muslims, righteous Muslims, we have no option but to respect and love the Torah and Injil. So these two books are the books of the Muslims. Without believing in these two books, we will not be able to be believers. Not possible. Now which Torah and Injil? The original version. Don't confuse with the corrupted versions that is available in the market today. Those versions are corrupted. We are not talking about them. We are talking about the original book that was given to Prophet Musa and Isa. Do they exist today? Where do they exist? We don't know. Those to whom we have given the scripture recognize it as they recognize their own sons. 
those who will lose themselves in the hereafter do not believe. Christ's message actually makes sense. That's why he's he's the Messiah. That's why he's he's the mediator between God and man because he's the only one who understood it, who understood the parables. The Lamb stood before him and took the book out of the hand of him who sits on the throne. That book is the Bible, and that describes how only Christ understands the Bible because no man in heaven, nor in the earth, nor under the earth was able to take that book understand that book and that book would be the Bible no one else except for Christ was able to understand the parables it's his doctrine that makes him the Christ it's understanding he's the only one who understands the parables and only through him it says that he is the door which means that only through him are you going to understand this book that's what Revelations chapter 5 says and only through him can you understand it correctly. Otherwise, it's just going to be confusion. It is he who has sent among the unlettered a messenger from themselves, reciting to them his verses and purifying them, and teaching them the book and wisdom, although they were before in clear error. Mark even clues us in on this by having Jesus say, and when he was alone with his disciples, he said to them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, outsiders, all these things are said in parables, so that seeing they may see, but not perceive, and hearing they may hear, but not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. This is a clue. He's basically saying uh, the, the whole gospel I'm writing is like this. It's a parable. Uh, to outsiders, it's going to look like a story of a historical Jesus. To insiders, it's full of rich uh, uh, allegorical and symbolic information. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you are in doubt about that which we have revealed to you, then ask those who have been reading the scripture before you. The truth has certainly come to you from your Lord, so never be among the doubters. Allah told him in the Quran that he could confirm his revelations by going to the people of the book, Jews and Christians, and making sure that his revelations line up with their revelations. The idea of a God giving birth, uh, uh, or a God being born to a virgin, or, or a God giving birth to a child through a virgin is just one of several pagan myths that made its way into the New Testament. The final line in Revelation 17 sees the angel tell John, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Here we get final confirmation that the woman, this whore in this context, is the city in question. 
It is also the first time we see her specifically associated with prostitution, as she is said to have written on her face the words, the mother of harlots. As well as this, we also see the words Babylon the Great appear on her face, identifying her as Babylon, and consolidating the words of Isaiah and Jeremiah, who in the Old Testament, speak of Babylon as if it were a woman. What unfinished business is being conducted here? Again, seeing the mother as far more than a girl in Nazareth named Mary. As in the wedding at Cana, where she represents Israel petitioning God for those messianic graces, at the foot of the cross, the mother represents the church. And Jesus places the church, symbolized in his mother, into the care of his disciples, symbolized in the beloved disciple, a church who we appropriately refer to as mother and is symbolized in the example of discipleship of Jesus' mother, Mary. What is remarkable is not Mary's simple life as portrayed in the Gospels, but the extravagant development of that life in later centuries. Mary's own biography blossomed over the centuries, with early Christian writers like Justin elevating her as a second Eve, whose obedience reversed the sin of the original garden dweller. The second Eve, whose obedience reversed the sin of the original garden dweller whose obedience reversed the sin of the original garden dweller, reversed the sin of the original garden dweller. And so here again we see, in the Blessed Virgin Mary, as she's presented in the scriptures, going from such a simple girl in Nazareth to the model of discipleship and caring for those in need and the visitation, to giving glory to God and being set up as a symbol of Israel giving birth to the Messiah as Mary gave birth to the Savior, to one who represents Israel, making petition for the messianic graces fulfilled in Christ's miracle at the wedding at Cana, to representing the church itself. And so in understanding the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary, as John presents her as the mother in his gospel, we see Mary as much, much more than simply Mary from Nazareth, but the mother of Jesus, which is the people of Israel that gave birth to the Messiah. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. What about the Ark of the Covenant? Well, you look at the New Testament, it very clearly depicts Jesus as the new manna from heaven. Jesus describes himself as the bread that has come down from heaven. Now, if you're a first century Jew and you know that about Christ, then the question that follows is, well, if Jesus is the new manna, then where is the new ark? So when you look at Exodus 25 to 40, you're going to see some elements of the Ark of the Covenant that are really important for understanding Mary's identity in the New Testament. Here are a, a few of them. First, I've already mentioned, it's the dwelling place of God on earth. It's the dwelling place of God on earth. It's the dwelling place of God on earth. Second, it's a sacred container, okay? So it was, a, it was a box made of acacia wood. They put three things in particular. First, the manna from heaven, already mentioned that. Second, they put the two tablets of the Ten Commandments in the ark. And then third, they put the staff of Aaron that miraculously budded to show his tribe was the priest, priestly tribe chosen by God. They put the staff of Aaron in the ark and they carried it 
uh, about with those three sacred objects. Scholars recognize there's a parallel being drawn here. Look what it says. Revelation 11, 19. John says, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of His covenant was seen within His temple. Now pause right there. If you're a first century Jew, you've been waiting for the ark to show up right, for almost six centuries. Right, since the time of Jeremiah. Everybody's waiting. When is the ark going to come back? Where is it going to be? So when John has this vision, this is a big deal. The doors open. John sees into it. Then he also sees another sign in heaven. What? A woman clothed with the sun. And the two verbs that John used here parallel one another. And scholars have pointed out that he appears to be describing, and he does this elsewhere in the book, like overlapping symbols. Two ways of looking at the same thing. The ark and the woman, right? The place where God dwells. Mary, the mother of the Messiah. The mother of the Messiah. The mother of the Messiah. What are the implications of Mary being the new ark? Well, first of all, it should just tell us about the holiness of Mary. Right? Sometimes people get bothered because we call her Holy Mary, Mother of God. Well, she's the new ark of the covenant. I'm sorry. She's holy, <laughs> like by definition. Okay, her body is consecrated. It's set apart to be the dwelling place of God. So in the book, uh, Jewish Roots of Mary, on page 58, I take you through more parallels. This is just one. There are about five parallels between Mary and the ark in the Old Testament and New Testament in the visitation to Mary. Um, so in the Old Testament, uh, 2 Samuel 6, David arose and went to the hill country of Judah, just like Mary arose and went to the hill country of Elizabeth, when living in Judah. Well, again, Catholic and non-Catholic scholars have recognized it's because he's drawing out the parallels between the ark coming up to Jerusalem and Mary coming up to the house of Elizabeth, because she is the new ark of the covenant. Now, if you have any doubts about that, you can just fast forward to the book of Revelation, and there's one more connection between Mary and the ark. It's in uh, Revelation 12, again, the image of the woman clothed with the sun. So if you are in doubt about that which we have revealed to you, then ask those who have been reading the scripture before you. The truth has certainly come to you from your Lord, so never be among the doubters. Parallels between Luke 1 and 2 Samuel 6. They show that Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant, the Ark of the Old Covenant was a type of the Virgin Mary, just as its contents were a type of Jesus Christ. That's because Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant. Consider the stunning parallels between how 2 Samuel 6 describes the Ark of the Old Covenant and how Luke chapter 1 describes Mary. The statements are parallel because the Bible is identifying Mary as the Ark of the New Covenant. Moreover, in 2 Samuel 6, 9, the Lord referred to is, of course, God. Mary, the Ark of the New Covenant, was graced by God for her unique purpose and role of being created in a state of sinlessness and perfection. In an ancient Jewish setting, if your son was a king, then you were a queen. So important. In other words, Mary is the queen mother of the kingdom of God. Mother of the kingdom of God. Mother of the kingdom of God. Now fast forward to the New Testament, and when Mary becomes the mother of Jesus the king, what does that make her? Obviously, the new queen mother. She's the queen mother, not of the earthly kingdom of David, but of the heavenly kingdom of God. Now, that, that is striking. And again, you don't have to take my word for it. The Bible tells us this. So God just simply takes a woman and uses a woman in Bible prophecy to represent a church. You have here this woman who represents a spiritual power, and she is controlling the beast, which represents a civil power, and so what you have is a uniting of church and state. And the woman whom you saw is the great city, which reigns over the kings of the earth. So the Bible makes it clear. 
She's going to be in control. And she's going to be in control clear down to the end of time. God just simply takes a woman and uses a woman in Bible prophecy to represent a church. Baruch gives a prophecy of the new exodus. It's a prophecy of the end gathering of all the scattered children of Israel. But in this prophecy, he depicts the end gathering as children coming home to their mother, with Jerusalem being depicted as a mother waiting for her children to come home. With Jerusalem being depicted as a mother waiting for her children to come home. Depicted as a mother, depicted as a mother, depicted as a mother, with Jerusalem being depicted as a mother waiting for her children to come home. All four Gospels feature an appearance of the Blessed Virgin Mary somewhere in the Gospel, but they do it by varying degrees. For example, the earliest of the written Gospels is the Gospel of Mark, and Mary appears only twice, and once she is actually named. Where she is named is when Jesus appears in Nazareth. And they ask, isn't this Mary's son? But in the Gospel of John, which is believed to be the last of the four Gospels to be written, Mary appears only twice. And both times, she is anonymous. She appears in the wedding at Cana, and then again at the crucifixion of Jesus at the foot of the cross. And each time, it is not Mary was at the wedding, or Mary was at the foot of the cross, but rather the mother of Jesus was at the wedding. The mother of Jesus is at the foot of the cross. Considering that this is the last of the four Gospels, the other Gospels had been written, and we know what Mary's name is, there had to have been a reason why John the Evangelist chose to include Mary in those two scenes, but never identify her. In the Gospel of Luke, Mary is depicted as fulfilling the role of the Ark of the Covenant in the New Testament. She is the Ark, so to speak, of the New Covenant. And even Protestant commentators on Luke, who know the Old Testament well and who looked at this, it said, it appears here that Mary is being depicted as the New Ark of the Covenant. In other words, her body is the new dwelling place of God on earth. Her body is the new dwelling place of God on earth. Her body is the new dwelling place of God on earth. If Jesus is the new Moses, who's inaugurated a new Exodus, and who brings us into the heavenly promised land, right, the heavenly temple, like Hebrews says, then where does the new ark belong? Where does it go? It goes in the heavenly holy of holies. And not just Mary's soul, because it wasn't Mary's soul that's the ark. It's her what? It's her body. Right? This is a quotation of a prophecy of the new exodus. When God is going to save his people in the future, he's going to make a way through the desert and lead them home to the promised land in ways similar to the path through the desert that he made at the time of Moses and the Exodus, where he led the people out of Egypt, through the desert, and then to the river Jordan. So what Isaiah says in this oracle is that in the future, there's going to be a new Exodus. That's one of the categories that they describe the future age of salvation with as a new Exodus. So John the Baptist as the prophet of the age of salvation, is also a prophet of the new exodus, a prophet of the new way of salvation that God is going to make with the coming of the Messiah. Who is able to stand when God's wrath is 
poured out? That's the question. And I think chapter 7 answers that question. Those who are able to stand are those who are sealed or protected by God. And, and, and those who are sealed and protected by God are the 144,000. Well, there are two places in the book of Revelation that mention a group of people that number 144,000. But notice this time it mentions them and it says, no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women for they remained virgins. Now, once again, if it's true that only these 144,000 people are going to heaven, then that would once again indicate or suggest that only Jewish men and Jewish virgin men, because it says they were virgins, could get to heaven, which means that that excludes all of the church fathers, that excludes the apostles, and that also excludes the Jehovah's Witness founder himself, Charles Taze Russell. There before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps and they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. And they sang a new song. And they sang a new song before the throne No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless.
Mary says these words, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my savior. Why? For he's regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. And behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. All generations will call me blessed. All generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Jesus says to his beloved disciple, there's your mother, which means anyone who's my beloved disciple. Jesus is implicitly saying, anyone who is a disciple of mine, whom I love, my mom is your mom. If you're gonna be my disciple, my mom is your mom. And he's saying to his mother, and woman, new Eve, mother of all the redeemed, my beloved disciples are your children. Why do we call Mary our mother? It's because Jesus gave her to us. You have a mom. You have a earthly mom. You have a mom, you have the church is our mother. But you also have a mom that Jesus himself gave to you. We must have a relationship with Mary as our mother. Why? Because the next line in John's gospel is, and from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. You now from that hour, he took her into his home. And the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and one who loved Jesus, also loved Jesus' mom as his own mom. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Secondly, the 144,000, they're not only described in Revelation chapter 7, but we also see them described in Revelation uh, chapter 14. And there the 144,000 are described as the redeemed of the earth. How do you escape the wrath of God? You're sealed and protected by God. And as we go on and read in chapter 7, how does that happen? Well, John makes it clear in chapter 7, doesn't he? We're sealed and protected by God because we're washed by the blood of the Lamb. How, how is it that the uncountable multitude comes out of the great tribulation and stands before the throne of God forever because of the blood of the Lamb? The wine in this case is what she teaches. It's Satan's deception regarding the scripture. In other words, she takes the word of God and leads people astray from what the word of God teaches. The age of false teachers and counterfeit Christianity was already well underway. And in fact, continued to be on the scene as he wrote almost 2,000 years ago. If Mary is the new ark, and it makes sense that her body would not experience corruption, but would be brought up into the heavenly holy of holy. Remember, the ark was made of incorruptible wood, and so was the body of Our Lady. So if Mary's the new ark, what is it that's in her body? The Word made flesh, the bread of life, and the eternal priest of God, the true priest, Jesus Christ. That's who she is. That's the role she plays.
the day when Allah will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, remember my favor upon you and upon your mother when I supported you with the pure spirit, and you spoke to the people in the cradle and in maturity. And remember when I taught you writing and wisdom and the Torah and the gospel. And when I restrained the children of Israel from killing you when you came to them with clear proofs. And those who disbelieved among them said, this is not but obvious magic. What does Jesus do in the miracle? He doesn't just change water into wine but it is the best of wines. The best of wines is reminiscent of the words of Isaiah in the Old Testament. It's a prophecy that he utters, a very popular reading in funerals, when Isaiah says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will provide for all peoples, a feast of pure foods and choice wines, juicy rich foods and pure choice wines. On this mountain the Lord will destroy the veil that veils all all peoples, the web that is woven over all the nations. He will destroy death forever. So the reference to the pure choice wines flowing down from the mountain is symbolic of the eventual messianic age in which those graces of the Messiah and the Messiah's salvation will bless the world. And now we have the purest of choice wines at the wedding at Cana after a period of seven days. So we look at the Blessed Mother the mother of Jesus, in the midst of all this. And what does she say? She says, they have no wine. And Jesus responds with a reference to his hour. What's the other thing the mother says to the servants? Do whatever he tells you to do. This is not necessarily the mother showing her son up and putting him in an awkward position so that he does something about the fact that they have no wine. But basically her message is the message of anyone who follows the covenant of God or as a follower of Jesus. We are all called to do whatever he tells us to do. So what do we have in the wedding at Cana? We have a wedding in which Jesus performs his first miracle. But we also have a metaphor for much of salvation history in which the mother, unidentified, is set up as a figure of Israel making petition for that messianic grace when the choicest of wines will flow down from the mountain and the web of death is destroyed. And we have Jesus, when his hour has come, providing those pure choice wines that Isaiah prophesied about when he speaks of the grace of the messianic era. Consider Galatians 4:4, 4, 4, quote, "But when the fullness of time had come, but when the fullness of time had come, but when the fullness of time had come, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law." Galatians 4:4 4, 4 teaches that he was born of woman. Galatians 4:4 4, 4 teaches that he was born of woman.